Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I think as Brad mentioned, my name is Cullen Combs. Uh, I'm a ruling elder at University Presbyterian Church over there in Crucis. Um, we send you our greetings uh, for, from University Press. Uh, we pray for you all often, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. So, uh, This past week, I had the pleasure of taking uh, many of our youth from Southern New Mexico, uh, from uh, University Press, uh, Anderson and Elias from here from Westminster, and a, a few folks from uh, uh, El Paso out of Christ the King, and um, the other church would just escape my, my mind. Uh, Los thank you, Los Tierras. And uh, we all went up to the mountains of Colorado, and we had a great uh, week at YXL, it's a Youth Accelerating and Leadership. It's a ministry of, of uh, University Pres and uh, spreads, uh, spreads to many different uh, PCA churches with, throughout the United States. And, uh, and this past week, uh, we had um, uh, Caleb Harlan, He's the RUF minister from uh, the University of Oklahoma at Tulsa, and he shared with us many thoughts from the uh, John chapters 13 through 17 of Jesus unfolding to his disciples his last and kind of final words before he went to the cross, typically called the upper room discourse, i.e. sitting around a dinner table and having a discussion, and Jesus giving his final instructions to his disciples um, before he was delivered over to death. And uh, so this morning, we're going to look at a portion of that. But let me just kind of set the table for us out of that section of, uh, out of John's Gospel. First, um, you know, when I, when I get kind of bummed out, I like to go to the Upper Room Discourse and just read it. And just hear what our Savior had to say to his disciples. And those words first and primarily are written to his disciples. And it's, it's important to kind of keep some of that in mind, particularly as you start to get in some issues with the Holy Spirit and whatnot. But those words are also given to us. Just as Jesus instructs his disciples, he then also by extension is instructing us. And we get to eavesdrop in on this wonderful, intimate conversation that he has with them. The Gospel of John is a gospel which focuses much on love, but it's interesting. In the first 12 chapters of John, uh, let me get my facts right here, the word love is only used six times. But then when we come to John chapters 13 through 17, it is used 31 times. And this intensity of the gospel is building. For normally the pattern in John's gospel, and I'm going to get to our text here in a second, and we're going to pray, but let me just kind of continue to set the table. The, the normal pattern which John has up through the first half of his, of his gospel is that Jesus will do a sign, and then he'll kind of give an explanation for it. So, for instance, John chapter 6, you have Jesus feeding the 5,000, walking on water, doing these miraculous events, and then he gives the, the teaching that he is the bread of life. Having the example already in the mind of him feeding the 5,000, doing this miraculous event of multiplying the loaves to feed everyone, he then shows that he is the true bread of heaven. But now, within this section, what Jesus is doing is he is proceeding before his sacrifice that he is going to make upon the cross. And as he sits down at that last meal with his disciples and institutes the Lord's Supper, here he gives the instruction about what he's about ready to do. He's about ready to pour out his life were these men gathered around the table. Probably some of the other women that were there with them that were his followers. He's going to give himself for them. And then he gives instruction on what the significance of this is. And of course, that love would be paramount 
in this teaching is so clear, as we will even see in our text today, that the Son of, Son of Man will lay down his life for his friend. So let us turn now to John chapter 15, which will be our text for this morning, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 19. That's one of the dangers of asking me at the beginning of the week what our text is. You see here it's a little bit longer. As I started to develop it, I realized there's more I had to say. But we're going to go through this relatively rapidly and be able to kind of get through and what, what Jesus has to say. So John chapter 15 Verses 1 through 19. Before I read, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we come and now gather around your word, we know that we have the promise of the Holy Spirit who will lead us into all truth. O oh, Holy Father, Abba, please do now send your Holy Spirit to stir our hearts to believe your most holy word. Let us relish the sweet taste of your word today, Lord. Let us look and drink deeply of the well of grace found therein. And we ask, O oh Lord, that this word today from John chapter 15 would stir our hearts, that you change us, transform us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. So John chapter 15, beginning at the first verse, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you do, can you, unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done so for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one. Uh, excuse me, let me restate that. Greater love has no one than this, that a person lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends because all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of my Father, ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. This I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Thus ends the reading of God's word. So, five points come out of this text for me this morning as I look at it. 
and forgive me, I don't have an alliteration, but uh, the five points are the true vine and the true vine dresser, would be our first point, the true branch which bears fruit, third point, the withered branch is cut away and burned with fire, fourth point, love and joy, the, the benefits of being in the true vine, and the final point, the world's hatred, a mark of true belief. So our first point, the true vine and the true vine dresser. This, the, this one verse here, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Jesus, this is the last of Jesus' seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. As we remember, when Jesus says I am, he's not just making a grammatical statement, but he's making a theological statement. He is saying, I am who I am. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> Exodus 3, when God revealed himself to Moses, speaking from the bush. So Jesus now associates himself as Yahweh, as the Lord God Almighty, the one who has redeemed his people you know, it's not just that Jesus is like, I am God. But this is good news because our God is almighty. He's powerful. He's true. Nothing can thwart him. And when he says, I am the vine, or the, excuse me, I am the true vine, there's assurance there that our Lord is giving us. He's a he has any prerogative whatsoever to say that I am God anytime he cares to, but he's associating this with his work that he is coming to give his disciples and by extension us. He says, I am, so I am the Lord, the true vine. When he says true, He's speaking of genuine. He's speaking of everlasting. He's speaking of eternal. He's speaking of the genuine article. He's speaking of that he is the fulfillment. Just give an example here. In the Old Testament, Israel was known as the vine of the Lord. Now, this is Give one citation here to give illustration. In Jeremiah chapter 2, the Lord says this of Israel. Let me get there. He says uh, in verse 21, Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How you have turned before me into the denigrate in into the denigrate plant of an alien vine. Israel was called to be the vine of the Lord. Isaiah has this picture of how Israel ultimately will one day be a vineyard which will cover the whole earth. But normally when the, 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 uh, the mark of Israel being brought up in the Old Testament is, is brought up by God, it's normally a means of condemnation, of saying, I called you to be my vine, and what is a vine supposed to do? It's supposed to spread. spread, bear fruit, cover, give it covering, bless others through its fruit. And Israel, time and time again, refused to do that. And let, let me give a technical term for this, but then it, but, don't get just bogged down in the, the technicality, but just see the wonderfulness of this. This is what we call in, in, in the scriptures typology, that which is a sign in the Old Testament, usually called the type, and how Jesus is then the anti-type which fulfills that which was the sign. Time and time again, all these images that I could go through from the Old Testament, Israel fails to meet but then the true Israel, Jesus, 
fulfills that. And that's what he's saying here when he says in John 15, I am the true vine. I'm going to fulfill what God has with this purpose. And the cool thing is, how does Jesus fulfill this true vine idea? He has to have what? Branches. He has to have you and he has to have me connected to him. Not that, and let me, let me just preface here before anyone burns me at the stake. I'm not saying that God is dependent upon us, but God in his divine plan appoints us to be part of him and his work. What a privilege that is, which our God calls us to. But I'm not there to the branches yet. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. The father himself walks through these pews. The father steps through the ranks of the church. You ever been in a, a vineyard before? It's a, usually a really nice place. And you go through and you'll see things. I don't know if the, the image is coming to me is from the Godfather, but we're not going not gonna to look at that one. But, uh, but we're, we're thinking about a nice vineyard. And here's God the Father taking pleasure in his vineyard. And he's coming along. He's like, oh, that needs a little clipped in here. I need some adjustment there. And he's molding and shaping his people. All these branches. You know, sometimes I think, and, and I think the Gospel of John really illustrates this. Um, sometimes we have this view from popular kind of thinking is that God the Father, it's, it's actually an old heresy, God the Father is this angry guy over here, the Old Testament God. And then we got this kind and loving God, God the Son, and somehow he placates the Father. And that's the exact opposite view which John, John's Gospel is giving, giving it to us. Who can quote John 3.16? <laughs> For God, and when he says God, God, God the Father so loved the world. It's not that God the Father is restrained and God, and God the Son's the good guy. But they're working in tandem together to bring forth their collective purpose. They're not at odds with each other, but rather they're in harmony with each other. And the love which God the Father has for his people, so the Son has as well. So when we think of God the, the vine dresser, which we're going to get to look at in the next verse, in our next section, we should think of someone who is caring for us. We should think of the tender love of God for those who are in Christ Jesus. So now we turn to that the true branch bears fruit. We get to tackle a few more verses here. I kind of arranged the verses so we could kind of examine them in, their, in this grouping. Again, I'm not trying to abuse the text, but uh, wanting us to kind of see the theme here. So we'll, we'll look at verses 2 through 5, 7 through 8, and then 16. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit, Itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And jumping down to verse 7. If you remain in me, and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And then verse 16, you did not choose, choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should, would remain 
so that whatever you ask in my Father's name, he may give you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about us, the branches, and how we are commanded in this script, uh, passage of Scripture to bear fruit. So before I kind of dive into this text, I kind of want to make a general comment about this that I think, particularly with us as Reformed Presbyterians, we may struggle a bit with. Okay? So we are saved by what alone? Grace. 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 Right. It's all grace. And I totally agree with that. But I think at times when we sometimes boil our, our ideas down to just maybe a motto at times, we can actually miss really the full depth of what the scriptures are teaching. We are saved by grace alone. It is a gift of God. There's nothing we can add to our salvation. There's nothing we do for our salvation. But, but, we're not saved just to go sit off on a shelf. In fact, what does the scripture say what our condition was before we were saved? Dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. A corpse does what? Stink. Nothing. <laughs> it can't do anything. But if you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're alive! You've been raised from the dead. You've experienced the first resurrection. And as living beings, we do things. You know, God, just as God charged Adam to go out and work, so we as his disciples are commanded to go out and work and produce. We're going to get into why that is, but I, I kind of want to unpit sometimes the idea that, that works have nothing to do with us and our identity in Christ. We were created for work. Work is good. Work was blessed in the beginning, in the garden. And our Lord calls us to perform good works. And that does not contradict his grace. Rather, it bolsters it. Because if you have been made alive in Christ, you will produce fruit and be a blessing to those around you. So let's, now that I kind of got off my hobby horse, let me now let's look at this, this text. So it says here that the father, the vine dresser, goes through and prunes us. You know, pruning again is, is kind of the cutting away of the of the dead branches or the or the parts that are not producing well. And what is that? If you've ever looked at a vine before or a tree and cut off a little bit of it, and then what happens? That that branch grows back even stronger. It's it's the father coming and enabling and cutting away those things which are standing in the way. He's it's his care for us when it talks about him pruning us. He is, he is, he's taking and he's purifying us and making us more and more useful for his purposes. He's working out his purpose in our lives by this pruning. He's cutting away sin. He's bolstering the gifts that he gives us. He's enabling us to do the work which he calls us to do. It's not just that God calls us to do things, but that he gives us the ability to do so. And we see God the Father here as the master gardener. We see God the Father bringing this pruning. And as Hebrews 12 reminds us, this pruning can be taken 
uh, can be painful. In, in, uh, in Hebrews 12, the analogy of the father to the son is used. And Hebrews 12, 7 says, if you, were, if you endure chasing, God deals with you as, as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? That pruning, that pain, is one of the marks of being in Christ. In fact, that text in Hebrews 12 goes on to say that if you are not disciplined, then you are illegitimate, and you're not of the Father. You know, I remember Mark's, uh, not Mark, uh, uh, Swindoll, uh, Chuck Swindoll was preaching a sermon, and he said, you know, he says, if you got everything in life you ever want, and you don't have any troubles, he said, watch out. <laughs> you may not be in the kingdom. God the Father brings adversity into our lives to change us and to lead us into greater holiness. It's not because he's a killjoy, but rather he wants to grow us into the man and woman that he wants us to be. No athlete wins the race by sitting on a couch and eating Twinkies. So we must run the race hard. And our father, when we decide we want to go lay on the couch, you know what he's going to do? He's going to get up. Let's go. We're going to go do another lap. He doesn't let us rest on our, our own laurels but rather he lets us rest in Christ, in which we're going to get to, but he disciplines and prunes us for our betterment. All right. But then, he, then Jesus turns and he says a statement, which I, I really appreciated uh, Caleb's teaching up at YX on this, because it, it, it really brought it home. I'm going to just kind of give you what he had to say, because I really love what he had to say, because I think it really amplifies what it says here. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever, you, or it should be, no, um, we're going to get to that other difficult text in there in a second. So, uh, uh, do, 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 do. oh, yeah, that's what you want, Father, sorry, I'm going to get it here. Um, I'll just go back to the text here. Um, verse 3. You are already clean because the word which I have spoken to you. So you are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. You know, I think when we kind of think of our, our lives and, and uh, sometimes you're like, Lord, can I do anything right? <laughs> um, and then Jesus has this emphatic statement. He says, you are already clean. It's finished right there in John 15 because of my word. Now first we want to lean into that latter half of that statement. Because of my word you are clean. But then you, I mean, we just step back and we think about our own Christian life and we have to sometimes say, wait a minute Lord, I, I, I know you've done the work, but I sometimes feel dirty. I sometimes feel like, am I even a Christian? Do I even really know you? And I want us to see this, and I, I think it's interesting, uh, the, the picture which Jesus gives us earlier on in the beginning of the discourse when he's up in the upper room, and he's washing the disciples' feet. And Peter, of course, he objects. Oh no, Lord, you, you can't wash me. And, he's, and then, of course, Jesus says, well, if I don't, you have no part in me. And he's like, oh, well. <laughs> and then, how about a whole bath? And, uh, of course, Jesus then says, um, in verse 10, he says, he says, he who is bathed needs only wash his feet, but it is but is completely clean, and you are clean. So here's the way, I, I like this picture that, that Caleb gave us. He says that we, are, we have been cleansed and we're being cleansed. 
we have the objective reality that we are justified in Christ because of his righteousness, which is imputed to us, given to us, covered over us in our salvation. But as we know, in this life, as we continue to walk along, we sin, which is uncleanliness, which is filth. And what does Jesus come again and again and does? He cleanses us of that unrighteousness. Much of the theme of 1 John is all about this verse right here being amplified. It's the cleansing work, continuing cleansing work of our sanctification, which is Jesus is working out in us. But it's connected totally to the fact that we have been cleansed. And I think this picture which Jesus is giving us, you don't need a whole bath, Peter. We just need to wash your feet. We need to take care of this issue or that issue. That God continually, and Jesus comes back again and again and again in our lives and continues over and over again to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Because he is faithful and true, as John says in 1 John. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not within us. But if we confess our sins... He will forgive us of those sins. That continual cleansing. But we are able to stand before the Lord. And just as in the book of Zechariah, when the priest comes and he's accused by Satan because he has filthy clothing on, what does God do? He takes off that filthy clothing and he gives him clean clothing. That's what God does for you again and again and again. He continually is cleansing his people because he has cleaned you. It's kind of a, a both and as our Lord has continued to work out our hearts. And again, he reminds us of this imperative that this fruit bearing that we have is because we remain in him. He says it right there directly. He says, if a, vine, if a branch doesn't remain in the vine, it can't bear fruit. It can't receive those nutrients. You know, you've cut open a branch before of some sort or another. What comes out? Water. You can see the nutrients flowing. So is our union with Christ. He nourishes his people and he reminds us that apart from me you can do nothing this isn't to discourage us from doing anything but it's re it's reminding us to have the proper perspective that it is only through his sovereign work that we are able to do anything which includes these bearing of good fruit. What is this fruit that Jesus is speaking of here in this passage? It is the fruit of love. It's the fruit of love which comes forth from us. And what is fruit there for? Fruit is there for the enjoyment of those who are in the vineyard. It's not just that you take your fruit and you, you go off by yourself, but rather, sorry, but rather you're there to share that fruit with others. You're there to take those, let's just use the, the I think he has in mind here, the, the grape, to take that grape and smash it up and make some wonderful wine. He's there to, to give those grapes after on a hot day of working, of sitting down and enjoying a few to refresh yourself. The love which God has given each and every one of us, we then are able to share with those around us. This is the fruit which Jesus is speaking of here directly.
So what is it, how do we maintain this remaining in Christ? You know, it's, it sounds kind of mystical. It sounds kind of like, well, what are you talking about, Jesus? How do we do this? What's the magical formula? What's the secret? Being here this Lord's Day, this is remaining in Christ. Coming to this table is remaining in Christ. Seeking the Lord in prayer is remaining in Christ. Picking up his most holy word and reading it is remaining in Christ. You know, I had a conversation with a young man a few weeks ago, and he was struggling with a particular issue. He said, well, I, I, I've really, I've been praying about it, and I think the Lord wants me to do this, which was a direct contradiction from things that are in the scriptures. And I just asked him this one question. As you've been praying, have you picked up this as you've been praying? Have you looked in to see what God is speaking to you? What he's saying to you? Uh, well, no. I kind of just been me and God just kind of talking. I said, well, you know, I really, I don't want to discourage you from getting on your knees and speaking to the Lord. But the Lord has spoken. And his word, as he says to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, is sweet as honey. It is that word which in Psalm 1 is makes us a tree planted by streams of living water and makes us grow. These are what I'm com what we, we theologically call the means of grace. And you could maybe say, okay, I got all those things. And uh, yep, uh, check, 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 I'm doing all those things. But those are not done also, I want you to see this too, those are not done in an individual fashion. But rather, they are done in the context of God's covenant community, the church. Such that St. Cyprian was bold enough to say, which John Calvin will later quote in his institutes, outside of the church there is no salvation. Now, Cyprian wasn't saying, and Calvin wasn't reemphasizing that it's the church which saves us. But this is the vessel in which God pours his people. This is the vessel where God meets out his grace. It's not that God is incapable of going outside of the church, but rather this is the appointed means by which he has ordained. And you know, over this last couple of years of seeing people drift away from the church, I've seen them drift away from Christ. Our God is merciful. This isn't a man-made institution with our own ideas. Rather, this here, the body of Christ, Christ is how we physically connect to our Savior. And I'm not discouraging you from going off into your quiet place with the Word of God and having intimate communion with Him. I want you to do that as well. But you've got to come back here week after week. There's a reason that God set a six and one pattern. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. And the Sabbath is given to us to rejoin us week by week, to restart our week and be connected to his people, which connects us to Christ. All right. So, so now we come to verse 7, which I stated earlier, sorry. If you remain in me and my word remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Boy. Number one, this verse has been twisted by many. <laughs> um, 
Jesus is not promoting the lottery here. He's not giving us a health and wealth gospel. But he is giving us a sure promise. When we say pray in Jesus' name, that's not just tacking on his name at the end of a prayer. That means that we're praying in his will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is the will of God that we are entering into when we pray. And that again is why I encourage you to have your Bible open when you pray. Because this is where God has revealed his will. And, and you may be praying for something that is good. You may be praying for it earnestly. You may be looking to the, the scriptures and God has an answer. Trust him. He does all things well. And there's not going to be, everything is not going to be worked out in this lifetime. But there will come a day when we shall stand before the throne of grace and see it all completed. You know, if you, if you look at a tapestry from the backside, it looks like a bunch of strings just hanging down randomly, kind of, what the heck's going on here? But then you look on the front side where the tapestry maker is working on it. We, you see a beautiful picture. And I think a lot of times in this life, we look up to heaven and we see a lot of strings hanging down at us. And we don't fully have all these things figured out. But the same God who created the heavens and the earth, the same God who split the Red Sea, the same God who raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, and he does all things. So when we say pray, and I will give you whatever you ask, it's because we are in tune with what the will of God is. And you know also, sometimes when you pray and something doesn't happen, it may not be God's will. And I can tell you there's been many prayers that I'm so glad he has not answered in my life. Because I had my will, my agenda, my way that I'm coming to God with. And yet, my merciful Father knows this sometimes wayward, stupid son and says, uh uh. Or he's like, I got something better for you. And so when we pray, we should pray earnestly, expecting us that God is going to lead us. He's going to transform us. Prayer is not us informing God, but rather it's God informing us. And I think sometimes we reverse that order and it, it can cause the difficulties. All right. So point number three, and this will be brief, but uh, it's in the text, so I've got to deal with it. The withered branch is cut away and burned with fire. Verse 6. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Jesus again and again and again and again and again in this passage it says, remain in me. He's he's just driving this point home. You have to receive your nourishment from me, or you wither and you die. And I, not to draw out the analogy too far, but I think what our Lord is saying here is there's going to be people that are going to say, I'm a branch, I'm a branch, I'm a branch, I got this under control, I'm doing it, I got this, I'm doing this under my own power. And those are going to be cut away. Just like at the end of the age, 
there's going to be some that are going to come and say, Lord, Lord, I did all these things in your name. And what does he say? Depart from me, for I never knew you. This is a call to account. This is a call to self-examination. This is a call to say, am I in the vine? And we're going to get to how that actually is manifest out here. But what really, what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's showing them that apart from me, you can do nothing. And he's, he's tearing away at the false profession of just saying, yeah, I believe. I got this Jesus and me and some other things here and it all works out at the end. No, he's saying that you must abide in me. True faith must be possessed by the person. They must be made alive in me. And uh, let me just give further from, from the Apostle John, I think, in, out of his first epistle, what he's speaking of here. 2 John 2.19, or 1 John 2.19 says, um, uh, I'll start in verse 16, or 18 to give context. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even even now many antichrists have come by which they are uh, by which we know that this is the last hour and they, then he says they went out from us but they were not of us and if they had been of us they would have continued with us but they went out that they might be manifest that none of them were of us we can have a false religion which purports to believe but can be shown to be false. And it's shown to be false by not continuing to abide and bear fruit in the sun. So what does this drive us to? I mean, it, apostasy is a real thing, to turn away from the Lord and to reject him. It drives us to say, Lord, save me. Continue to keep me in your grace. Utter dependence upon the Lord. This verse should strike us with. That we need to remain and keep within him. And this is what this, this is uh, coming to. Our fourth point. Love and joy are the benefits of being in the true vine. Let me read it for us again. Just as the Father, I'm oh, sorry, picking up in verse 9. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you and re remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. These things I have spoken to you that your joy may be in, or, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full this and then skipping down uh, verse 12 this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you greater love has no one than this that a person will lay down his life for his friends you are my friends if you do what I command you no longer do I call you slaves for the slave does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends because all the things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. And then verse 17. This I command you, that you love one another. Let me ask this question of yourself and this answer in your own heart. If you want to shout it out, go ahead. Is it more gratifying to obey God or to sin against him? brings you pleasure. You know, sin for a moment can be pleasurable, but ultimately in the heart of the believer, it brings great sorrow. And, you know, that, that trick of sin is that, yeah, yeah, oh, that looks so nice and pleasurable. And that's what entices us over and over again. But then when we commit whatever sin that is, Whatever commandment we break, 
It brings sorrow. It doesn't bring joy. And, and you know, this is a hard section of times like, oh, this is this sounds like Jesus is being a little legalistic here. But it's not. Because the joy of the Lord is to love his law. It is true pleasure is found in obedience to God's most holy word. Whether you're 12 or 82, that is where pleasure is found in obedience to God. And God doesn't give commandments to be capricious, but he cares for us. And he has set boundaries for us. And this is an expression of our response of love. But you then say, well, wait, does it, is it an expression of that I hate God when I sin? Well, yeah, I hate God when I sin. But isn't there a great relief that we then follow his command to confess our sins? Even there... God is merciful and gives us the outlet to be restored. That's why Martin Luther said the Christian life is one of confession and absolution. And what do you do after that? Well, you confess and you get absolved again. And you confess and you get absolved again. It's continually, it's not going back and trying to undo what you did, but it's continually going back to Christ. It's going back and saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to forgive me of these sins, which I have sinned against you and to you alone. And pleasure is found in obedience. And yes, we want to talk about confessing our sins, but we also want to talk about growing in our obedience. And again, I refer you back to my last point of how do we grow? Grow here in the church, under his word, listening to God. Our Father gives us commands not to begrudge us, but for our joy. I know my own simple heart at times bristles at that. Because a command kind of like, man, I don't want to be told what to do. Of course, I'm leading back into my first Adam, my original father, when I think that. But commands ultimately are not there to burden us or box us in. But they are there to bring us joy. And as Jesus says here, that our joy may be full. And why is our joy full? Because we love the Lord's commandments. This is, the, again, the origin of all this love. If you love God, you love his commandments. If you love God, you want to do what God does. You want to figure out what the Lord's will is and do that. And that brings joy. And that joy then allows us to share the love of God with others. This is a wonderful, beautiful circle which God gives us. And he has this demonstration. Again, this is, again, this is Jesus giving instruction before he goes to the cross. No greater love is than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. Jesus giving, saying, hey guys, I'm about ready to go die for you. And you know, this isn't the valiant death of a Greek myth that, you know, is just noble because he died for his friends. But it's an effective death we don't have time to really fully talk about right now. Which secures all this love to these guys. 
and that secures this love to you. It secures this love to me. Because of that Jesus has laid down his life for us. And not only has he laid down his life for us, we are no longer standing off at a distance being servants, but we are brought close because of this death and called friends. Finally, we turn to the last section. Um, let me just get my notes straight here. The world's hatred is a mark of true belief. And also, I kind of want to talk a little bit about finally kind of bringing back this idea of union with God, being joined to him. If the world hates you, you know that, the, that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but because I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. I'm sure many of you have seen the, the media and, and coverage of everything after Roe versus Wade was overturned. And just some of the viciousness, I don't know how else to say it, of the reactions to this decision. The wanting to hold on to this idea that at any point one can terminate a pregnancy. A lot of hatred was seen there. And, you know, the accusations flew. Of course, you know, we can talk about the legal ramifications of the Supreme Court didn't outlaw abortion, but um, just, just the reaction to it all. The way that the world saw this quote-unquote right being taken away from them. And then we have to stand in the gap. And I'm, I'm bringing this out because I really wanted to bring a tangible example to you of the world hating you because of Christ. The world loves death because it's dead. And when John uses the word world, which next week we're going to look at the high priest of the prayer, we'll get to look at it more, he's speaking of a system that it is in opposition to God. The world hates God's commandments and the world hates God. And so Jesus is saying here, and he, again, this is actually really practical too, what he's about to say to these 12 guys. Well, yeah, 11, because Judas had left. 11, and then we'll have the 12th pointed later with Paul. What happens to these 11 guys? They all but one die a martyr's death for Jesus. James is thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. Peter is crucified upside down. John, the writer of this epistle, dies on the island of Patmos, exiled away from his friends. Matthew, I'm not going to remember the martyr in my exact account anyway. I can't remember. Philip probably went all the way to India and was speared to death. Or no, Thomas. Sorry, Thomas. That doubting Thomas, carried the gospel all the way to India and was speared to death there. The world hated them because they come and they're saying something which is in opposition to it. Instead of hatred, love. And the world hates love because love 
transforms and confronts us and changes us. And the world wants to stay back here in its sin and degradation. Because all they know is not the pleasure of the Lord and following his commandments. What they think brings gratification just brings destruction. And if you're in Christ and you're following him, the world's going to hate you. And, okay, so, said all that, so what is our response then to that? Do we hate them back? Do we just get mad when someone is ups upset about abortion? No. We love them. Jesus said, love your enemies. The Apostle Paul says, it's like, how do we cast cold, hot coals upon our enemies? We love them. This is the paradox of the gospel. This one goes antithetically against my own just innate nature. Is that I am to love my enemies. I am to love the world. I'm not to be a part of it, but I'm to go and carry Christ's love to it. Apostle John later will say that we are to be in the world, but not part of it. That we are to carry this message of love. There's many different ways this works out. This is a, a, a sermon on cultural engagement. But ultimately, the way that we transform this world is by the love which is shared in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news and as Paul says in first, or 2 Corinthians, to those who are being saved, it is the aroma of life. But to those who are perishing, it is the aroma of death. But thanks be to God that God sometimes changes our palates. That he, the friend that you've been witnessing to for 40 years, one day the light comes on. And that which they hated, now they love. And that you can say about every person in this room who has placed their trust in Jesus. At one time, one of us, each of us, all of us, hated Christ. And he went and died for us. But now he transforms that hatred by his love when he renews a heart in his effectual calling when he calls us out of darkness into light, when he calls us out of death into light, he, when he calls us out of hatred into love. Our Savior is calling us to abide in his love, to abide in him, to cling tightly to him. Can we talk about how we do that today a little bit? And we just ultimately remember that it is apart from him, we can do nothing. But do you know the other book into that is, and, and this is implicit in that statement, but then, but through Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things. Jesus loves his people. Jesus gave up his life for his people. And Jesus wants his people to bear fruits to bless other people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this brief look at, at your teaching out of John 15. Pray, Father, that we would continue to abide in your word, continue to study it, to love your commandments, that we may grow in love for you. Thank you that you loved us first, Jesus. And that you called us to ourself or to yourself. And that because you have loved us and given us your love, we can love others. And let us abide in your love. We pray all this in Christ Jesus, our Savior's name, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forevermore. Amen.